welcome to the Real Talks with So Sad Ireland Wellbeing Series. My name is Alan O'Mara. I'm the founder of Real Talks, a former Cavan GA player, an author, and a performance and wellbeing coach with sports and business leaders around the world. For this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Leanne Kiernan. Leanne is a brilliant footballer from Bailiborough and County Cavan who has represented Ireland at the highest level. She is also the reigning player of the year for Liverpool Football Club. Leanne reflects on the ups and downs of her journey so far and explains how tough times have helped her to build both resilience and confidence. Leanne also shares her experience of grief and discusses the importance of friendship, family and reaching out for professional support. Just to note, this conversation was recorded at the start of the season before Leanne picked up the injury that kept her out of Ireland's recent World Cup qualification success. We wish her a speedy recovery and have no doubt that she'll be back on the pitch soon. You can check out the Real Talks with So Sad Ireland Wellbeing Hub at sosadireland.ie forward slash Real Talks, or you can also search for Real Talks on whatever podcast platform you prefer. There you'll find previous conversations with Rory Stories and for those I love, along with mental skills masterclasses on things like self-awareness, resilience, self-compassion, and more. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind all our listeners that So Sad Ireland is here to support you and your mental health. So Sad Ireland provides support and services free of charge to people who are struggling with suicidal ideation, self-harming, bereavement, depression, stress, anxiety, or if you simply need to talk. Please go to sosadireland.ie to learn more, about services like counselling, crisis support, a 24-7 helpline and text messaging services. If you are in a crisis situation and need urgent help, please call 1-800-901-909 now. That's 1-800-901-909 now. Thanks for listening. Leanne, thanks so much for joining us on the Real Talks with So Sad Ireland series. It's a conversation I'm really looking forward to having. It's a strange one. I think all the years I've been doing this stuff, I've never got to interview someone from the same town as me. So it's a great experience. I'm glad to have you on. And I just wanted to start with, listen, you're sitting there. You're coming to us from, from Liverpool. You're about to start your second season with one of the biggest clubs in the world. How has that journey been for you at Liverpool? And are you excited by the, the season ahead? First of all, it's lovely to be here. Um, I appreciate you wanting to be on this show. Um, no, the season has been going really well last season anyway. I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed the move to the north of England. I think it suits suits me and my lifestyle a lot more than London, I guess. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to this season and just express myself a bit more on the pitch and that and hopefully we do very well. In terms of last year, you mentioned there you had a really good season. So for anyone that doesn't know, you were promoted from the first division and you were a key player on that during that campaign. I think you scored 13 goals. How much did you enjoy that journey in terms of like rediscovering your form, having a sustained run in the team? I think you were pretty good on fit- fitness-wise and with injury-wise. How enjoyable was that for you? Do you know, it was just like a breath of fresh air. Um I had dealt with chin splints and it put me out of all of my last season in West Ham, so I, I didn't really get to play a minute that season. And um, it was quite a mentally challenging time as well as physically. So I signed with Liverpool in the summer of last last year and um, I still wasn't fully right and I knew I had a lot of rehab to keep doing to get on the pitch, but uh, they understood well on how to manage me and get me to the form I could be in confidence-wise, but also have the fitness maybe off feet instead of being on the training pitch all the time. And it's really worked. And thankfully this year, Touchwood so far, they've really been manageable and I'm still being able to express myself on the pitch. Yeah, and you, you strike me as someone, and obviously I've been following you for a couple of years, very much like thrives on being a confidence player and like playing with a smile on your face. So to get that, to get that run of form, and I seen a couple of clips of goals you scored last year. It was kind of there was a few clips I saw. Even there was a there was a grin cheek to cheek on your face back playing. Like was that a nice? You must have really loved getting that feeling again. Yeah, for sure. I think um, when you lose, when you lose the chance to being able to play, you only appreciate it more than when you get back on the pitch. Like that year out really, really made me appreciate my job a lot more, and kind of. A kind of reality bite, you know. So when I got back out, it was just 
Listen, when you're, as you say, like when your job's going well and you're enjoying your job, life's pretty good usually. So it's been going well. And you say like the kind of, the reality bite there, Leanne, like what, what do you mean by that? What was that kind of perspective or that kind of greater understanding the, the difficult time of injuries helped you kind of to gain? I guess um, growing up through Shelburne and the boys teams and everything, I, I was thankfully always healthy and fit and ready to rear and go. And then I wasn't really, I really never had an issue with injuries or never really had to deal with that side of the game. And I always, like, I never really understood, like, what being out a year would, would mean to the body and your head and everything. And I kind of guess it kind of, it also, with being a negative, it was quite a positive for me because I got to to work on myself and become a better person out of it and maybe appreciate life a bit more. And... Like on on that mental side of injuries, Leanne. Like I mean, people will people will go through all various different injuries in their life. Via if they're a sports people or not, and there's a presence of pain. But then also, it kind of stops you doing an activity that you like to do, and that's often one of the things we're we're told in terms of a well being perspective. That hey, you can go go for a walk, or you can go for a run, or go to a gym. Um, how difficult was it then, kind of having that removed? from your lifestyle and how like your day-to-day life really I guess it's um it's probably different like when you're playing in the evenings but you have like your purpose in your daytime like you're going to school or you have your your job outside of your sport and then it's not as maybe it's hard to deal with because you have a good distraction but in my sport obviously that's my job and this is what I'm made to do but when you can't perform in your work and you can't be the best you can be due to injury and that um it's quite mentally challenging I would say the most thing like I remember going into the gym and I think Justin Bieber's new album was out on the and we had it on the speaker in the gym and I just thought after like a month off the album I just thought I cannot listen to any music anymore and I was just like I just need to get out of this gym you're looking at yourself every day and it's kind of like you think you're getting you're getting somewhere and then you have a setback again and when you thought you were aiming to be ready for maybe November and it's February now and you're still not on the pitch and it's just quite mentally frustrating. And obviously you have you're in a contract like you if you're not performing and you're not able to get yourself on the pitch, why would a club want to keep you? So you obviously have that on the back of your mind too. But I was quite lucky that I had really good people around me and I have a really supporting family. And that really helped me get through that period of my life. Oh, incredible. Um, I really appreciate that perspective, Leanne, because like, sometimes even like as fans at home, you forget that this is someone's job. You know, you alluded to there that someone doesn't have the escapism of going to work during the day or going to school or going to college. And that must have really challenged your identity then and your sense of self, not having that thing that you've been years working towards for, for quite a significant period of time then, did it? Yes, for sure. And I guess it's like I'm quite, I'm the character that kind of needs to know what's going on in the next few months of my life. Like I like structure and I work best off structure, which I've kind of realized in the last few months. So like not knowing when I'd be back and it's not like a hamstring issue and you have 10 weeks and then you're ready to go. It was a loading issue. So like I don't know when it was going to flare up or calm down. So it was quite like the not knowing really affected me, I guess. But um, they were very understanding West Ham like they let me go home for a couple of weeks after January and then um, that really kind of like reset me to get me through the last four or five months of the league and like in terms of that say mental reset and, and like from a well-being perspective and how did like what how did that time at home help kind of re-energize you or reset you what was it about that that was able to to kind of help you on that path um, I guess the distraction, the distraction and just like the heads, my headspace was kind of much more clearer because I was home, I was around my family, the people I love and the f- people I'm most comfortable around and they quite understand me and um, they understand like maybe what I need and it was the love and support from them that like gets you through and the belief that like I'll come back and I'll be a better player and a better person from my year out which is quite nice and just the confidence, especially my mom and dad has in me to like not stress about not getting a club or like everything will work out and everything happens for a reason. 
and just kind of take the positives out of the crappy situation you get into. No, it's amazing. It's like it's some when when we can get access to it, just the power of that support of loved ones or be connected to the people who see us for who we really are and. I think that's one of the things like when you get to family like that, they see you as the anchor and the person, you know, they're not necessarily worried about the football or, or it, it, it's certainly not their first concern. And then you mentioned kind of a couple of times already around like the mental challenges and then kind of give you time to work on yourself or be back a better person. In what ways did that kind of window of time help you achieve that, like help you feel like you've developed or grown as a person? I guess I feel like the best way to grow is to be put through a hard situation. And I feel like I've grown over the past few years through tough situations. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really when you're at the point, you're like, Christ, can anything go right? And that's where like, when you're at rock bottom, I feel like, I don't know, something switched and really made me appreciate the smaller things in life and the smaller goals that I win every day. And even if it was just like going for a coffee and getting my headspace right and enjoying being around my friends, enjoying my FaceTimes with my family and just the small things that maybe you take for granted when you're in a good place. And like somebody asked me the other day, what's my aspiration in life? Just randomly, one of the girls in the car and I turned around and I wouldn't have said the same answer now. If you asked me when I was 18, I would have had a complete different answer. But now I turned around and I just said, do you know what? It's simple. I would say contentment and happiness and then just a healthy happy family around me like that's all I need like obviously money's great and everything's great but once you have like your mental health and your physical health and the people you love around you I feel like no money can pay for that or no things can buy that so I just feel like um I've really grown on that side of my my kind of characteristics which really probably matured me in a way too so I am grateful for some of my struggles in life yeah 100 percent. and I know like that's I think like what you're describing there too is like the process of building resilience where we have to go through hardship or adversity and cope with it and overcome it and I'll definitely talk a little bit more to you specifically about resilience later but I suppose also what it sounds like is like that um that time gave you an an extra bit of space to really appreciate you as a person I know particularly in the sporting world people get caught up in athletic identity and very much because your life purpose is so sport orientated and so focused and as you said it's it's every day via training eating sleeping recovering playing games but it sounds like you benefited from that time to kind of grow your perspective but also maybe appreciate yourself a little bit more and love yourself a little bit more am I kind of picking that up right yeah for sure and then I feel like when you're quite healthy in your mind. You, um, I don't know if it's just me, but I look in the mirror and I, I like, I love the way I look and I wouldn't want to change anything. And I feel like when you're in a healthy mindset, you, I don't know, you have this bit of a glow about you. Like, um, nobody can kind of burst your bubble, I guess. And like people, people could say comments to me and I can just put it aside and be like, well, that's your opinion. It's not true. You know, where, that's probably what I've grown on too and I feel like a big thing is who was there for you when it wasn't going well and when you did struggle and I know my family was always there and I have a small group of friends that I can really rely on and you really get to see on like who's really good for you in your life and they show up when maybe the others are there to clap you when you're doing well Mm. so it's um it was, I think it's quite a maturity thing. And I don't know, when you're younger, you think, oh, wow, like I have so many friends and everything, but you get to realize that maybe three or four friends is better than having 40 fake ones. <laughs> I think that's, um, like, I think it's such an important point, Leanne. It's probably, you know, like it's a mentality when you're younger that's maybe somewhat accelerated by social media where people are looking at, like, I, I know when I was in school, it was how many, it started off, you know, how many Bebo friends you had. And then it was how many Facebook friends you had. And then it was like, wait, that person has over a thousand friends. They must be so popular. Um, and then it obviously drifts on to Instagram and there's Twitter and there's thousands. But as you, I think what you're saying there, and obviously we're, we're doing, having this conversation around Real Talks at Southside Ireland, which is very much about, you know, mental skills and things that can help people in their day-to-day life. Like what you're really driving home there is the importance of, the quality of connections and friendships and rather than the quantity, right? Is that like, I think that's a fair summation of what you said. 
Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. No, it's it's amazing. It's such it's such a good point. Um, wrapping up on the the Liverpool side, Leanne, just jumping back into that for a minute is like you. Obviously, we've just talked about that journey of growth. Um, in terms of yourself on and off the field. So then what was it like to get a call to join? As you said, look, listen, for anyone that doesn't know also, there's the, there's the insecurity and there's the doubt of being released from your club because you haven't played, looking for a new club. What was it like then for the for the, the call to come in from one of the biggest clubs in the world? It was now, it was a former manager, Matt, Be- Matt Beard, right? That was with West Ham, um, who's now the Liverpool coach. For him to call you and ask you to join and then to be to be ended up wearing the number nine shirt for Liverpool. What's that? What was it like to, I suppose, get that? I don't want you to call it a sliver of hope or a bright light during a bit of uncertain times, but what was that like for you? Um, I kind of believe that everything happens for a reason and like your path's already kind of made for you. And I feel like that was the perfect time and for what I needed in life at that point. And I remember I had a Zoom call with Beardy and my dad before negotiating anything got to do with signing with Liverpool and me and my dad just had a chat about like life with Beardy and just what he sees from me and just he just spoke about me as a person and that and I came off the phone and my dad goes that's where you need to go I just have a really good feeling in this and I feel like that's where you need to go because my agent was looking at other clubs and looking at other countries and that and I just thought you know what you're right That Zoom call really just helped me sign the paper. (laughs) Jumping all the way back, Leanne, it's like, obviously, as of right now, you're you're sitting here, you're talking, you're getting ready to go play in the Premiership, one of the best leagues in the world with international stars littered all over it, English players that have just won championships, uh, just international from all over the country. I suppose if I was to bring you all the way back, like to to Baylor where I've been in school, like at at what point in your life did you start to twig, hey, professional football might be an avenue for me here or might be an actual um, career choice for me. Do you know, it's strange. I never thought about it. And it was weird. Like, everybody asked me this question and I, I just really, really enjoyed playing. I remember I was obsessed. Like, we'd go to Dublin and I remember my dad would leave work early and he, he picked me up just straight after school and we'd head up and I'd have my football with me and I'd have to be I'd have to be a half an hour early and be the first in the change room and I'd bring my football and I'd practice in the change room every single session before we'd even go out on the pitch and I was just obsessed with it and it's what made me happy and I guess it was kind of like my safe place. Mm. It's where I felt like alive and where I could really express myself. So I remember my dad turned around to me and he goes, by 18 you're going to make the senior international squad, like you're going to make it. And I just kind of looked at them and was like, nah, no way. And I think I was 16 or just turned 17. I'm not sure. And I remember I got my first call up, made my debut, scored on my debut. And I just turned around to my dad and I goes, you're wrong. (laughs) So I definitely, um, I definitely at that point thought, well, maybe I can do something with this. And I just got on to an agent to kind of give me links across the water. And... I don't know, I was in Bally Hayes Agricultural College, studying farming, <laughs> as you do in Cavan. And I never really forced anything. I always thought, like, if something comes up, I may take the opportunity. But right now, life's quite good. I'm really enjoying life. I'm happy. And the opportunity, Beardy rang me one day and says, listen, I've seen you play with Ireland. I'd really like you to come to West Ham. And I kind of hung up the phone and I told my dad, like, I'm not sure what I want right now. I'm quite happy in life. And he goes, Leanne, you've worked all these years and you've traveled so many miles to just say no to an opportunity of once in a lifetime that any kid would want. And I says, you're right, let's get on the plane and let's have a look. So we had a look and I remember coming out of the meeting in West Ham and I thought, I want to stay here. And bear in mind, I had no idea how to live on my own, how to cook. I was more like the outdoor person that like mom would do all the stuff indoors and maybe my sister and that. And I would go and like feed the dogs or like go to the farm. And I was always doing outdoor work. So I never really had to deal with life inside. So I, I think that was the best decision. Like when I have kids, 
if they get an opportunity to go abroad or live away from home, I would definitely advise them to go because in the last, it's my fifth year going into professional football now. And I think I've grown so much as a person since leaving home than maybe what I would if I was still at home. And I quite like the point that I've kind of went away from my family and kind of made a life for myself where I'm not reliant on them. And as a person, I, I wouldn't like to rely on my parents anyway. I've always had like a good work ethic and I'd always try to go out and and make my bit. But um, no, it's just, it's been a really good decision and thankfully it's all gone really well so far. And then I'm just thinking as you, know, as you described that time of, of moving away from home, like so up to that point you've been, you've living at home, you've graduated from, from school, then you've gone to a college locally. So you've always been living in the home house ultimately, right? And then to, to, I suppose to move to London, I'm, I'm just because I'm even thinking of say from any young person listening to this, Leanne, that does if they go to college and it's the first time moving from you know be it Bedford to Dublin or from from Mullingar to Belfast or going over to the UK, like what was that time of your life like of like moving? Because I suppose you're taking on two challenges. One, you're going from like an am- it was an amateur football perspective into a professional setup, but then you're also going from being someone who's living at home to like an actual adult now that has to literally survive by yourself and cater for yourself and look after yourself. So what was that, the first couple of months of that time or like that time window like, Leanne? I would say it was a big, big thing for me moving out of my comfort zone and what I was used to. And like, I knew nobody across the water. I had to start from scratch, make new friends. Like some people have one or two links and then that kind of drives them to the place, but I had nothing. And I was just going off kind of, hope that it would all go well and I just think it was the best decision I've ever made and I would definitely advise everybody listening to this to go get out of your comfort zone and go get what you want in life because staying in your comfort zone sometimes you you don't achieve and what you can achieve in life yeah and, and like doing that is obviously like it sounds like has accelerated your growth both as a as an athlete but also as a person yeah, and obviously it sounds it sounds like it's all great coming from my side, but of course there was months and I would just ring home all the time. My parents were coming over an awful lot because they knew that I was probably struggling a bit at the time. As I said, if you're not playing or you're injured or in general football maybe isn't exactly going the way you want it. And everybody knows form form changes in how you play. But um once you have a good support system whether it's in your job or your family or your friends, um, it's it's very doable and to go and get what you want in life. Leanne, I was just thinking there as you were talking, like, you know, because it's always easy when we, we look back in the rear view mirror and connect the dots of like, yes, that helped me grow and that helped me develop and I learned from this experience. But like, particularly in those earlier couple of months, like, was there ever a time you genuinely like were considering like, hey, maybe this is not for me. I should go back home. I should go back to the comfort zone that, you know, you've just talked about leaving and the importance of, because I feel like sometimes it, that there's that kind of tension or there's that inner conflict of, no, I'm trying to do this, but also the comfort and safety was over there. Was that ever a thing for you? Um, I'm quite stubborn and I probably get that from my family actually. Um, I feel like giving up was not an option. I've chosen this path, now I'm going to go make it. And that was the choice that I made from moving over. Like, I'm just not going to give it a year and then I'm bin it if it doesn't work. Um, of course, if I was un- really unhappy and I wasn't getting the best out of myself and I knew that this wasn't for me because I wasn't enjoying football anymore, of course, that maybe I would thought of that. But I was never at that point. I always loved the sport. And it, listen, if your body isn't working at the time, there's always, it's always going to get better. You just need patience and time. And I guess resilience. So giving up was not an option, though, I would say that for sure. Because I I know that I love playing football. And sometimes, like, in the biggest finals that we play in the FA Cup final in Wembley, like, we play big games with international with Ireland. And sometimes in the dressing room, just before I go out, like, people ask me, do I get nervous? Where I just think, no, I break it down to one sentence. Why do I play football? And it's because I love playing football. There's no more to it. Like, I genuinely love what I do. And, like, I appreciate, like, all the work my parents put in to get me to this level. And there's no way that I'm just going to put it in the bin because I had two or three bad days. You say, 
like you say you love the game and like you go I'm going back to like the and you say you love what you do like I'm going back to thinking of you sitting in the classroom in Baylor Community School where the guidance counselor comes in and gives you hey you got to do this online test to see what you're going to do and try and figure out a job like what what's it like for you to be able to sit there and a I suppose ha- express that love for what you do and also the gratitude for your family and those who helped you kind of get to where you are today what's that like for you I think it's um I don't know. I feel like I've been put here with a purpose of really doing my best in what I've been gifted, I guess, which is football. And I just think it's really nice that I can give back to my family and my friends and all the hard work they've put in behind the scenes that nobody else would see. Like we used to travel an hour and a half, two hours, four nights a week to Dublin. Like, and I'm glad that I've really pursued it now. And that, not that it was a waste of time. If it never happened for me, I still really enjoyed what I'd done. But hap- like, happily, it, it did work for me and I've got this far. It's just about, like, for me, I'm quite the person that it's never enough. Like, actually, the other day in our preseason friendly, I think I was on the pitch like 18 minutes or something and I got a hat trick and I walked over for a drinks break and I go to the goalkeeping coach, like, what is it I can do more? Like, is there anything defensively you want from me? Blah, blah, blah. And he just goes, are you actually being serious right now? Like, what is wrong with you? Go out and just do what you're doing. It's clearly working. And we were laughing about it after, but that's kind of the mentality I have. Like, I always want more and more. So this year, like, I, I feel like I have quite big aims in what I'd like to achieve. And I write them down on the whiteboard at the start of the year. And um, I really tick them off, hopefully, when, when I achieve them. And if I don't, I just work harder and harder until I can. And that that mentality you've just described, Leanne, of being, it sounds like obviously quite driven and, and wanting more and more, where, and you also you mentioned the word purpose as well in there, Where where does that come from? Kind of what's driving that? Was that always the way you are? Is that something you had to develop just from like a mindset mentality perspective? I I refer to my family a lot, but 100% from them. I feel like they've grounded me in a way that you don't get, you don't get everything handed to you in life. Life can be unfair sometimes, but you have to work your ass off and you will really appreciate what you get out of it. Even when I was, I remember being 10 and 11 and say if I wanted something for my birthday and that um obviously they gift me it but if it was simple things like going to the shop they'd be like I'd work on the farm and I'd get a fiver a day and I'd be going around thinking I was minted <laughs> with my fiver that I could go and buy sweets but it was always like you work for what you're given and it, I really really like the way I was brought up like that that I really appreciate everything that I earn and um I'd like my family as well when I have a family someday to to not be handed anything or gifted anything and realize that you've got to work hard to appreciate things. And even simple things like we go to the shop and my dad would give me money to go get him the newspaper or something. And he'd be like, I'll keep the change. I even struggle keeping the change. I'm like, I don't want any of your money or anything, you know? Like that's yours, I want to earn my own. Like simple things like that and how we've been brought up. My two siblings are very similar to me and um it's really it's really a driving factor in how how I've done in life so far and for them they've done really well my siblings so yeah and to have I suppose to have all those lessons Leanne and that kind of grounding from from your family and I mean anyone listening can uh, will will be able to hear that the love you have and the gratitude you have and the strong connection you have as a family um and obviously we spent a chunk of this t- conversation also talking about kind of some of the harder days with injuries and breaking through. But then kind of on the complete flip side, it must have been so nice to be able to celebrate big moments with them then. Like, you know, I even just I was when I was looking earlier, I ended up back in 2016, which was like a sound like a real breakthrough year for you. You scored a hat trick in the FAI Cup final, young player of the year, team of the year. I think your international debut came, scored on your competitive debut. Just what was what was it like getting to experience those and, and generally celebrate those together? Um, and those, and you mentioned the FA Cup final last year, like those big moments, like getting to then experience them with your family. Honestly, I, when you see the smile on my parents' face and my siblings' face, that's all I, I want to see. And like when I score, I look for them in the crowd. Like after every game, I'll speak to them and see how happy they are and that I'm doing them really proud. And I feel like it's just kind of like giving back to them and how hard they worked 
for me to get here. And it's just it's just a really nice feeling that um that I've kind of achieving things that um I've worked really hard for. No, it's just really nice and I like the fact giving back to them and like I remember my dad would hug me and kiss me after the game and he'd be brilliant you you were so brilliant, he'd be saying and everything. And it's just a really nice feeling. Like a feeling that not a lot of things could um could be. I mean it's it's beautiful. Um and to get those like of those big moments I I have I kinda of list them out really quickly there, Leanne, like the FA Cup final, your international debut, it was your West Ham debut, your Liverpool debut score in a particular goal. Is there a kind of a moment in your career that kind of jumps out at you that kind of is like as a milestone or as like a marker that's kind of is embedded in you? I would say for sure representing Ireland and scoring on my debut, that was massive. And I'll never forget the smiles on um, my friends and family's faces when I scored that goal. That was um, an amazing feeling. And obviously last year we won the league with Liverpool. And I'd say Ryanair sold so many tickets for the whole of Cavan to come over to that game. But uh, that was a really nice feeling. We had um, we had a party after with family and staff of Liverpool and everything. And it was just so nice that like I could give that to them and like my cousins and aunties, uncles and close friends and family could all enjoy the moment with me. And I, that was just really nice that they could come over for the weekend and... Everybody had a great time and just really enjoying life, which is really nice because that's what life's about at the end of the day is enjoying it. So giving them the moments as well with me is is a beautiful. Yeah, could I could I jump back to the international debut for a second? And like you mentioned, kind of seeing the smiles on friends and family's faces, and I'm sure they were they were cheek to cheek and beaming with pride. What was that like for you? What's your memories of the feelings that you had and the thoughts you have when you get? that shirt on, whatever it is. Like, just tell me a little bit more about that day, that occasion and that moment for you. Um, it's mad. I remember putting on the kit. I was only a, a skinny wee small thing <laughs> against these senior women that I was up against. And I remember the ball played through. I think it was Anya Gorman. And I remember thinking, I'm going to score here. I'm definitely going to score here. And I just I just kicked it and it went in. And I, I just think... Um, just the adrenaline of putting the ball in the net on your debut, I think it was amazing and something that I'll definitely remember. Just a sense of achievement and a sense of purpose, I guess. And as we said, like we all want purpose in life and I felt like that was that was mine. So it was it was a really, really nice feeling. Yeah, and even so when that ball comes true, Leanne, like you're coming through, like and even but I even an like you're in the stadium and but you have the clarity of thought or like it's it's ha- is it happening in slow motion where you're kind of like uh, like you're looking around and like I'm about to score here or is it all happening a million miles an hour like what kind of how is that working in the moment for you I guess obviously thinking you're going to score is the confidence that a striker needs and most of the time I have it now don't get me wrong of course sometimes we're not as confident as other days but definitely just the belief in like when the ball's coming through, that's all you're thinking about is your one task is putting it in the net. And um, I guess constant practice helps that too. So you don't you don't even have time in the blink of an eye. It's it's gone. And if it's not in the net, then you've missed out on your opportunity. And as we know, being a number nine, um, that's how you're kind of judged on putting the ball in the net. So. I'm feeling proper confident in this preseason, and it's been going well so far. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to put the ball in the net a good few times this season. That's the plan, anyway. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Um, in terms of confidence, then, Leanne, it's kind of a word that's popped up a couple of times so far in our conversation. Um, it's obviously like something that people desire, aspire to, be it if it's in a business setting, a school setting, a work like work setting, sports setting. And it, as you kind of touched upon, like confidence can kind of go up and down. It's not a fixed thing. It's not a stable thing. In times of, in times when you've been feeling low confidence or you've been struggling, what's worked for you in terms of rebuilding that or growing that back up to kind of the higher sense of, of self-confidence? I guess like there's several times in my career where I've been told like I'm, I'm not good enough for you'll get your chance when you're older. Or you get 10 minutes, go prove yourself. 
And it's just like taking them opportunities and taking managers' opinions like and comments like that into not frustration, but more like to prove people wrong. And I feel like as a footballer, you're constantly having to prove people wrong. And just about not losing, like if everybody else loses belief in you, you making sure that you you haven't lost belief in yourself because if you don't have belief in yourself, how do you how do you expect anybody else to believe in you when you can't even, you know? So I guess um, a big thing would be for speaking to my my dad is a, a big mentor for me in my career. And he really like, just kind of, if I'm coming in and having a bad day or maybe a bit negative towards him, he goes, come on, Leanne, like snap out of it. It's one day, we go again, we go again tomorrow, we've got this. And just that constant like, pat on the back when I need it, but... Also, the stop feeling sorry for yourself. Go get stuck in tomorrow. We go again. And I feel like that balance is really good to have. And I'm lucky enough to have a few mentors in my life that has provided that for me if I was struggling from time to time. And also, I feel like it's very helpful looking through old clips and when you were at your confidence. And like that's proof on the screen that like you've not changed in the last month or two. It's just lack, lack of confidence, not ability. And it's belief, a belief in that ability, ability that you can go get what you're worth. You just need to maybe work harder or practice a bit more on certain things and maybe question the coach and why don't you see me in your starting 11? Like, what can I do different? And it's all right sitting here complaining that you're not getting into a starting 11 and like bickering about it to all the other girls that maybe aren't starting, but that'll get you nowhere. Like you look in the mirror at yourself and what can you do better? on a day-to-day basis. And I know that, like, when I moved to Liverpool, I was out for a long time. My fitness is one thing. My strength-wise, I needed to get stronger, that I was injury, like, prevention, kind of. And then my confidence, again, and getting used to the ball. So I would do an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes shooting practice, extra runs, um, off-season, really working hard, focused on... I guess sleep was a big thing for me, focusing on my sleep. What I'm putting into my body is a massive thing. And I guess mental health was a massive thing for me. And I have a really good mentor at the moment. And I speak to him weekly. And he really gets the best out of me and understands me. And I feel like mentality is one of the the most important things to have in life. And I feel like that's most that's most things when it comes to work in any job you do, and especially football. People ask me like, "What did you do to get to this to get to this part of your life?" And like, of course, everybody trains hard and everybody has that, but it's your mentality and like your resilience and not giving up. And when you're thrown aside or you're not looked at the way you think you should be looked at, it's being able to bounce back from that and really, I don't know, it makes you stronger. I guess, yeah. Yeah, what you've described there, and and like, and thank you for that answer, Diane, because there's so much in that in terms of both confidence for mental toughness, resilience, and it's like I hear so much there in terms of if confidence is low, that you're making a commitment to keep showing up and to keep doing it, trying to control what you can control in terms of what can I work on, who can I ask, um, and then trying to challenge yourself to either get better or I think one of the interesting ones you said there, it's also challenging yourself to go ask a coach maybe for some feedback which may be some feedback you don't like or like being more vulnerable or having to be open is, is that ever difficult to open yourself up like that to to if it's criticism to feedback where sometimes I think it's easier you know maybe I'll stay over here and I'll kind of see what happens but to put yourself out there like that through courage through vulnerability um do you ever find that difficult of course it's it's not it's not nice getting the truth sometimes that maybe oh this player is better at this or they're taking their opportunities a bit more than you are. You need to work on this and that and the other. But if you don't ask, you'll never know. And you'll be constantly maybe thrown to the side or even forgot about where I know asking and sometimes I mightn't like the answer that I need to work on this, that and the other. But my mentality is like they're telling me this because they want to get the best out of me. And um, I just kind of see it as it's quite a positive like I hope when I'm 70 years old, 80 years old, if I make it that far, that I'll still want to like know things and learn things. And 
I think a, a big thing about my job especially is becoming like a sponge, wanting to learn every day. And it's not like me against the, the manager or me against the team, like we're all as one. And understanding that everybody's here to try help get the best out of each other. And I feel like I'm quite lucky here in Liverpool that that's the environment I'm put in right now. And it's really, really nice to be a part of. Yeah, I hear strong, like I hear strong, a strong sense of like a growth mindset from yourself, but then also people around you supporting that and empowering that and enabling that. So it must be nice to have that kind of combination. Yeah, for sure. It's massive. And I also think like if people's listening to this podcast that um, not to be ashamed of having a mentor off the pitch to, to help you mentally, to get you to the best place you can be to perform at your best, because realistically, like putting good food into your body, training as much as you can. But if your head's not in the right place, I feel like mentality is one of the main things that got me this far in life. And if I can work on that and get myself 10% stronger mentally, that that could maybe lead to 10 more goals in the season. And I'm willing to do that. And I feel like it's nothing to be ashamed of and people maybe have this stigma on it that now nah, like you can't be talking to a mentor to like to help you out. But I guarantee you, Ronaldo probably has one and none of us know about it. <laughs> um, and look where he's met it. So it's just about, I guess, the judgment and just taking the judgment of the way and what works for you. And I know that works for me best. And it brings out the best version of myself, both on and off the pitch. And I feel like I'm a much better person when I have this as well. So um, it's just about getting every single advantage you can in your workplace to perform at your best. And just about like not to judge anybody else's journey and really focus on yourself, really. I think that's such an incredibly powerful point because obviously we're talking today, this is the Real Talks with Soul Sad Ireland series. And so for if anyone that doesn't know, like Soul Sad Ireland is a not-for-profit charity that helps people and offers supports and services for people who are struggling with, if it's suicidal ideation, self-harming, depression, bereavement, stress, anxiety, or just being there if someone needs someone to talk to, to, all, to unload what they're worried about or what's on their mind. And you've described one variation of that relationship in terms of maybe it's like a performance coach, a mental skills coach, it can be a sports psychologist, it can be a career mentor, a life coach. Um, but ultimately... What it is, is is an environment for you to feel safe, to be vulnerable, to explore what you're thinking and kind of to reflect on, I suppose, what you have been doing and kind of what you want to do. Is that kind of the, the mixture? Exactly. And it's just about like what works for you. Like some people might need one and is really confident and mentally strong in that. And there's, n there's no harm in that either. But I feel like I feel like it's quite healthy to have a health coach or a life coach, or a mental coach. And even if it's, it doesn't have to be a mentor, it could be simply your parents, or your dad, or your mom, or your sibling, or something that you can go to, and you can, as you said, be vulnerable. But then come out of the situation and think, wow, I've got this. Like, for me, after my conversations with my parents, my mentor, I'm like, give me the ball, I'm going to put it in the net. You know, I'm feeling quite confident, and that's how I get the best out of me. And it's just about just not being ashamed of it. And we're in 2022 now. It's not like we're back in the 80s where it was like, God forbid, you had you had your own men mentor or counselor or whatever. Like, I think the stigmas, the stigmas going away from it now and people's realizing that it actually is helping this, the people that's maybe most successful in life get that extra 10% out of them, whether whether you're in like accountancy or playing football or just a teacher or whatever you know 100 percent, and it's so interesting because like even just for myself as an individual like i now work in this space as like a performance and well-being coach and but i suppose earlier parts of my life i've benefited from working with a performance coach myself to get the extra five ten percent out of myself but i've also benefited from from counseling and from therapy to get myself i'm talking about get myself back about five percent you know um and it's just you've alluded to it there in your conversation of that like different things work for different people and will only different different things at different times and i think life challenges us all in different ways we never know when or where or how and like that can be literally can be adversity trauma 
significant sources of stress from relationships, exams, our health, sport, work. And one of the things I did want to talk to you today while I have you is I, I had read an, an article previously you'd done on The 42 where you mentioned your experience of grief. And I know you lost your brother back in 2013. And if it's okay with you, I just wanted to ask you, like when you go through when you go through grief and losing a loved one, it's obviously extremely difficult, Leanne. It brings up many emotions and many people listening to this will have experienced it in different ways. Um, and grief does affect people in, in different ways. I suppose I also feel obliged to say there's no right or wrong way to grieve. It's a process that we have to go through over a period of time. But I was just curious, based on your experience, kind of what helped you get through the first couple of months of that? And if you, if there's anything you'd like to share with regards to grief for anyone that's either going through it right now or maybe we'll go through it in the future. Yeah, um, I get a bit nervous when I talk about this subject. Uh, I guess for me that was a really, really hard hard time for me and my family. Um, Paddy was my oldest brother and somebody I really looked up to. And I feel like I'm quite similar to him personality-wise. And that was a really, really tough time to um, be woken up to get that news. I think grief, as you said, everybody deals with it different. For me, I really, as I said, it was like my safe zone going to like football and going towards like kind of taking my frustration out maybe by just playing. I guess that was kind of football was my safe place at the time to just like, I probably, I was quite young. I was 14 at the time and of course it's hard at any age but I really didn't understand like why and I feel like I'm quite religious in a way and I I question like why God would do this to our family and like I feel like morally we're we're quite correct and like why could why is this happening basically but then I look at it in a way that like Paddy had he was 23 he had the best life and then um, he smiled every minute of his life and he kind of, I don't know, I just really looked up to him as a person and really wanted to um, be be like him. And I kind of, for me, I feel like I get most relief just thinking like he was put on this world to maybe be an inspiration to us as a family. And he was only put on this world for 23 years and maybe that was what he was destined to do. And in the space of 23 years and how he impacted his siblings and my parents was like massive. And I feel like I, every time I put the ball in the net or do well at life or overcome tasks that are quite difficult, I like to like dedicate it to him. And like, I don't know, I feel like a closer connection when I do well, that like he's always with me. And no matter how tough life gets that I know that he's by my side and he he can pull me through like maybe the darkest times. Obviously, it's not nice to any family to go through the loss of a sibling or a family member. And it's it's horrific, the timing and that. But we grew as a family stronger and stronger. And it took, this in 2013, it's been seven, nine years, ten years and um, I'm only being able to speak about it now after 10 years. I went through maybe six, seven years and I could never mention anything that had ever happened. And I took it really, really badly, probably in a way that it wasn't really mentally good for me, but I, I didn't know how to react or how to deal. Like you're, you're, you're still a teenager, you're a kid and you're getting this news and you're wondering why. And you think everybody is against you nearly, but um, obviously, counselling and having a really strong support of family and just being there for each other and really appreciating the small things in life and as I said dedicating the things that I've achieved towards him makes me feel closer to him and I guess it me being able to perform well and like do well for my family and it makes them proud that I'm making him proud I guess and for me, family is number one over everything and a healthy, ha happy family, as I said, is my aspiration in life. So, because um, I know what it feels like to, lo to lose somebody quite close to you. And 
yeah, I guess everybody deals with it differently. As I said, it took me 10 years, nine, 10 years to, to really like come out and speak about it openly. Still, this is probably the second interview I've, I've done about speaking about it. And I'm still uncomfortable speaking about it. But now that I guess we look back on old photos and I do a cheeky grin and my dad's like, oh, you're so like Paddy when you do this, which which puts a smile on my face because like maybe I've got some characteristics from him that I can bring to um, bring a bit of joy to my family, which is really nice. And listen, everybody has a tough time and everybody life throws stuff at you and it's what you kind of do with it. And as I say, like life's a roller coaster. You have to get on and you're going to have tough, tough times, but just to to enjoy the little things and really make the most of them because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So that's why every day, like, I know it's hard to like, when you're sad and you're in the ground and that, to like really kind of pull yourself out and try to do your best. But it's just realizing that like, there's, there's a lot worse things happening in the world than you missing a shot on target or you having a bad day because somebody annoyed you. So I just, I don't know, it's, it's been tough, but I've really been working on myself and working with my family to understand it and just become mentally stronger and resilient to things. And it, it kind of, as I said, in your toughest times in life, you really see who's there for you. And my parents, my siblings, we've got closer and closer. And I know that they'd drop anything for me if I ever had an issue and they'd be over on the first flight. Mom would, mom would start swimming if she needed to, to get over and see me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess just everybody deals with grief differently. Take it by day by day and just really realize that there's always going to be tough days, but there is good days after that. And as I said, sometimes people are just here for a certain amount of time and what they can do in that time is, is just amazing. And what, like 23 years of Paddy and honestly he's my biggest inspiration you'll see he's actually behind the photo I have him in my locket here so I'm quite I feel like he's always on me and throughout life that I'll always remember him and what impact he had on my life and my family and that he'll always be here and that I can do him maybe proud and you definitely are Leanne and just like just genuinely thank you so much for sharing your experience of that and kind of the insights that you've given because where it's one of the most difficult things in life you have to go through is is, is bereavement and is grief and um just I feel like it's coming from yourself it's, it's just going to be so helpful to either someone who's going through it now Leanne someone who may go through it in the future or has gone through it in the past and I really really appreciate your perspective and an insight on that and just to kind of to close this conversation out I think like one of the other things you mentioned there and it's kind of the perfect is like you stole my notes here from from what I was asking you because ultimately this whole series has been about helping people understand how how mental skills can help you live a happier, healthier life, can help you cope, can help you deal with those challenges that we've we've talked how that life throws at us when sometimes we're expecting them, sometimes we're not. And I was just going to kind of list so, some of these things I list out and we'll have already talked about. But I suppose I was just going to list out a number of kind of mental skills to you and just kind of see if any resonates with you most. If there's any you want to kind of talk about or say, tell me about one that's helped you. So I'll just list out a couple of them. Self-awareness, resilience, self-compassion, authenticity, growth mindset, courage, listening, self-talk, motivation, connection, empathy, trust, control, commitment, confidence. We've mentioned and you've mentioned a number of those words as we've talked. But I suppose as we close out, to give you an opportunity maybe to revisit or to talk about one of those that you feel is the most important or has been the most beneficial to you, Leanne. I guess confidence for me is a big thing. Confidence and belief in yourself, in what I do and my role. And it's just like, I guess for me also, um, if you have one bad day, it's just realizing and accepting it but trying your best not to make it into two bad days. And like certain things work for other people. I know that like I, I meditate, I bring myself back to the present time. Like I might go for a coffee with my friends and that just might me. It'll make me just feel 
a bit better. And it's just the small wins of the day really help. And just realize that if you're going through a tough time, that it's not going to last forever. And you can pull yourself out of it. And if you need support, just to reach out because the options are there and um, it's really helpful. I think that's the the perfect note to end on, Leanne. As I said, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be breaking down some of the mental skills I just listed. People that will li- have will listen to those will be able to listen to this conversation and get it from someone's experience like yourself. There's going to be other people joining us on the podcast. And I kind of, before I finish up, I do just want to say again that if anyone does need support or services, if you're struggling with, if it's suicidal ideation, self-harming, depression, bereavement, stress, anxiety, or literally you just need someone to talk to, you can check out sosadireland.ie to learn more. I'm very finally, and definitely the last thing I want to say is just thank you so much, Leanne, for joining us, for your time today, for your honesty, your insight, um, just the perspective you shared, the lessons you shared. I know anyone that listens to it will be inspired by it, will empathize with it, and we'll connect with it and just be and we'll learn a lot from it so thank you so much thank you for having me alan thank you thanks for listening to this episode of the real talks with so sad ireland well-being series you can check out our well-being hub at so sad ireland.ie forward slash real talks or you can search for real talks on whatever podcast platform you prefer there you'll find previous conversations with rory stories and for those i love along with mental skills masterclasses on things like self-awareness, resilience, and self-compassion. I just want to remind you that So Sad Ireland is here to support you and your mental health. Please go to www.sosadireland.ie to learn more about services like counselling, crisis support, a 24-7 helpline, and text messaging services. If you are in a crisis situation and need urgent help, please call 1-800-901-909 now. This podcast was hosted and produced by me, Alan O'Mara. Audio was mixed and edited by Jack Deacon, a plural video and design. And the music is from an original track called Everyone's Alright by harpist Mary K. Boylan. Thanks for listening.